I'm very pleased to introduce Anna Kwonkowska. No? How Almost. Do I Almost. How do I say it properly? Anna Kwonkowska. Kwonkowska. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> Anna is an assistant professor at the Department of Social Sciences, the University of Gdansk. She's a sociologist, a psychologist, a philosopher. Her research interests include transgender studies, men's studies, sociology of the body. Dr. Pankowska facilitates one of the few support groups for transgender people uh, in Poland since 2010 and cooperates with organizations supporting transgender people in Poland. So the title of the talk, Transgender People in Poland, Identities, Experiences, and Social Circumstances. Um, I have an abstract which I will read and then you will hear the details of it. Uh, so the presentation of this paper is to address in detail the situational experiences and social circumstances of transgender people living in Poland. Based on results arrived at through the author's research, the paper focuses on a number of accounts by transgender people regarding their social reception and the processes of normativization of their identities, as experienced in their interactions with experts who oversee the medical and the legal transition-related procedures. The arising problems with tran which transgender persons face in these situations are highlighted by the severity of the kinds of social pressures which are placed upon them, most of which are aimed at teaching them to conform accordingly to the normative patterns of masculinity and femininity as commonly acknowledged in Polish society. Uh, Non-normative and non-binary identifications in transgender persons are treated by officials in Poland as well as by the social environment as authentic expressions of transgender. Consistent with Foucauldian concepts of pol power and knowledge, or power knowledge, this discourse legitimizes a particular idea of social order and supports particular strategies of normativization. So Polish transgender persons' attitudes to these pressures and their subsequent responses are an analyzed. Okay, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. And thank you for the opportunity to give a speech and uh, share some information about transgender people in Poland. Uh, the data uh, I will be recalling today comes from a few sources. Uh, first of all, since uh, 2010 I've been uh, conducting interviews with transgender people in Poland. Uh, also with their cisgender partners, uh, parents and other family members. Um, I also had an opportunity of uh, shadowing a few individuals, that meant following them in everyday situations, uh, but also being present uh, at court sessions during the uh, legal gender reassignment process and accompanying uh, them uh, in hospitals while having some uh, medical um, surgeries connected to uh, medical transition. Um, because uh, Transfusia Foundation made it possible for me to get engaged in some um, activism and social work for the transgender community, I also had an opportunity of uh, open observation of the community. Um, and some information also comes from a study of um, internet forums from, for transgender people and autobiographical stories. <coughs> and um, at the very beginning, I would like to give you some introductory information which is necessary to understand the social circumstances and the situation of uh, transgender people uh, in Poland. Well, first of all, Poland is a Roman Catholic country with a conservative right-wing government uh, and that strongly influences the essentialist uh, perception of gender. Um, in Poland, there is also a very homogeneous society. By homogeneous, I mean a huge majority of people are of the same ethnicity, the same religious background. Um, so, um, with the lack of uh, other visible differences, um, every difference, every way of being non-normative or non-conforming is immediately noticed and thus may be stigmatized. Also, uh, what is important is that uh, in Poland, transgender studies have long been the domain of uh, medical sciences. Um, it, they developed in the late 80s and early 90s in the medical sciences, 
uh, sciences, and that was a domain of uh, psychiatric studies mostly. And uh, these uh, first uh, publications um, were used a very essentialist discourse, um, perceived transgender through an essentialist framework, and to avoid a label of deviation, aberration, or whim, presented transgender uh, as illness or chronic calamity. And can I ask you to show the first slide? As one of my respondents said, the attitude was like they will somehow tolerate you if they pity you. You know, it's like that. Since you are ill, it's not your fault that you are like that, right? And that was the attitude presented by medical studies. And um, additionally, uh, the medical discourse limited transgender to transsexuality only. Um, and fitting this definition became uh, the only way to transition in a medical or legal way. Can you? And as Martin says, Martin is one of trans activists. For many years, uh, he had a blog called Trans Optimist because he tried to change the image of uh, transgender people in Poland. And as Martin says, in the whole official process of sex reassignment, the most frustrating is the constraint of lying in order to fit the heteronormative pattern of a poor, unhappy misfit who, with the help of God doctors, mm -hmm. can finally become an ordinary Mr. Smith. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have to beg successive institutions to give us a chance of a normal, decent life, but we don't even get the right to be ourselves. No we have to be almost a perfect example of this function. And uh, social sciences discovered uh, uh, transgender relatively late. It was the late 2000s, so it's only the last decade uh, that any research on transgender is uh, conducted, in social sciences is uh, conducted in Poland. Um, the social sciences um, use a constructionist approach, feminist theories, queer theory, yet um, the very notion of transgender uh, in social sciences is still considered a terra incognita for many mainstream Polish academics. And uh, another important information here is how do people transition in Poland? I mean, there is no official legislation on gender recognition, but nevertheless, gender recognition is addressed in practice. And first of all, one has to be diagnosed. And as you probably guess, to be diagnosed, one should fit the notion of a so-called true transsexual. Uh, to be allowed to take hormones uh, and to start a medical or legal uh, transition. Um, the diagnostician is usually a medical doctor uh, who also specializes in sexology. Uh, also um, requires from a person to undergo a psychological evaluation, a psychiatric examination, and really a long list of medical examination. It's really a long list. I'm not going to read all of it right now. Uh, it would be quite boring and quite long. Um, some people from the support group I saw facilitate uh, counted that they even had something like up to 20 different medical tests performed. And um, so it's like a top to toe examination, really. And uh, only after that, a person can start hormonal therapy or, in case of people transitioning female to male, can have a mastectomy. Um, but the whole idea uh, of uh, the way people are allowed to transition in Poland is that post-transition they would be an unambiguous man or a woman. There is no place for non-binary or queer people. Um, and <coughs> another thing is to start a legal procedure. But before the legal procedure, uh, people are obliged to, fa to uh, divorce uh, that's if they are married. That's because same-sex marriages are illegal in Poland. Uh, so a person must divorce. 
Um, and then can start the legal procedure and here the whole story begins. Because the legal procedure means filing a lawsuit against your parents for wrongly recognizing the gender at birth. Yes. And, uh, and the parents must plead guilty and cooperate if a person wants to transition. I know a person whom it took seven years uh, because the parents were not cooperative. The thing is, the parents were relatively old and they didn't really understand the situation. If a person doesn't have parents, uh, then the court will assign some officials who act as parents um, in the name of the state. Also, the court will call expert witnesses. So even though a person already threw, went through a psychological, psychiatric and medical examination, uh, those tests may be repeated uh, because the court wishes so. And uh, also the judge who's to issue a verdict expects that a person will already be on hormonal therapy. If the person transitions uh, female to male, uh, they should already have the mastectomy. Uh, done. Uh, that's because a court wants to see uh, a person who will be very normative in their post-transition life. They just want to make sure. Um, also, the judge often asks about sexual orientation. So a person is supposed to, to be heteronormative uh, accordingly to their experienced gender. And people are put in a situation that they need to defend their gender identity, that they need to prove to the diagnostician and later to the court that they um, are a person of a certain gender and they have to be unambiguous in this gender. And that means they need to fit a stereotype defined by the East European and Polish uh, centered perception of gender roles and identities. And if I could ask you to give a slide, as uh, one of my uh, respondents said, when I started to have contact with some sexologists and other specialists, I noticed the exaggeration and expectation with which anyone, and here Mietek means every person coming for diagnosis, unambiguously defined themselves as a man or a woman. It wasn't important if they really defined themselves unambiguously, as long as they fit the stereotype the sexologist had. Because different diagnosticians may have different stereotypes of what it means being masculine or feminine. So what people do, in fact, they just exchange information. And they learn what should be taught to which diagnostician, what does the diagnostician expect to see or to hear, what should a person wear, what haircut should they have, uh, how should they behave. And sometimes it really turns into a ridicule. And uh, uh, as uh, Sławka says, uh, such doctors draw a conclusion that all trans people are straight. This is what they tell to their next patient. That's what they write in their publication. And this is how their publications are being cited in the internet. And as a result, a few years later, a poor little trans person who's looking for some knowledge and identity discovers that since their sexual orientation is different, it means that they must be some kind of pervert and will not qualify for treatment. And uh, as I've mentioned, those expectations uh, by diagnosticians sometimes really turn into a ridicule. And uh, Mietek, I'm not going to read this long citation, uh, Mietek uh, recalls a story uh, when he was transitioning and he needed a diagnosis. And this particular uh, diagnostician also uh, claimed it was very important that a person uh, had a girlfriend. He, he assumed that a trans woman could not have a boyfriend, that was still okay, but a trans man had to have a girlfriend, because a real man is a womanizer. Thus, um, some people would show photos with their girlfriends. That was not enough. You know, the photo could be fake. So preferably, a person had to bring the girlfriend with them. But it couldn't be just any girlfriend. She had to fit a stereotypical image of a proper girlfriend. So she had to be shorter, 
than this person. She had to be younger than this person. And if people didn't have such girlfriends, they would just ask friends to act as girlfriends, or as Mietek says, they had a practice of borrowing girlfriends from each other. And at a certain point, he wondered if the diagnostician realized that the same girl sometimes comes like four times in a month or something <laughs> with different men. And so the sexual orientation is like really important with the diagnosis. And uh, the question, as I've mentioned, is also asked by a judge in the court. And uh, similar attitudes also pervade in the individual social environment. And as Marek and Tomasz say, a lot of people deny the possibility of a trans person being homosexual and portray these issues leniently or treat them as a sign of uncertainty. I'd prefer to be hetero. Besides, how will I explain it to my mother? Mm -hmm. And when the court verdict is finally in force, if a, I mean, if a person manages to convince all the gatekeepers that they will be very normative in their post-transition life, um, a person gets a new identity. And that means a new personal identification number, because gender is encoded there. Uh, they also get a new name and usually a new surname, because most Polish surnames are gendered. As you've noticed, uh, I'm Kłonkowska. Mm. If I was male, I would be Kłonkowski. And uh, thus the na surname is also changed. So it's I for a, a for a woman and I for a man. And uh, but if a person uh, had uh, their biological children uh, before transitioning, the children still have their own data in their birth certificate. And I mean the person uh, themselves is issued a new birth certificate. I mean, the record remains in the court archives, but uh, what we use in everyday life, this like uh, shortened birth certificate, there is no information about transitioning. But the children have the old data of a person who legally doesn't exist anymore. So officially, this person is no longer a parent of their children. So if they want to act as a parent of their children, uh, what people do, they need to bring a whole court documentation and explain to every official, like at school or somewhere, that they really are a legal guardian of the children. Um, also, uh, only after uh, having the uh, legal gender markers changed, uh, people can have a surgery performed on the sex organs. And that's because, according to Polish law, it is illegal to deprive somebody of their fertility, even if the person wishes so. So they first need to be recognized as a different gender, and then it's not uh, depriving of fertility, then it's like a health-saving saving procedure or somehow. And uh, another thing that is important here is that uh, probably you're aware that in Poland um, the medical insurance is covered with our taxes. So in theory, all the medical procedures should be out of charge because we already cover it with our taxes. Um, and ex there are some exceptions like cosmetic surgeries. And with transitioning, any medical evaluation, and people really have to go through a long list of tests. Any uh, medical procedures related to transition are not covered. They count as cosmetic surgeries. And, um, and so are the hormones or surgeries. But now, I will tell you something really interesting. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but we almost had a legislation regarding gender recognition. That's because in 2011, a transgender woman was elected to Polish parliament. Her name is Anna Grodzka, and uh, while she was elected to the parliament, um, she um, uh, worked on a Gender Accordance Act. And this was proposed to Polish parliament in May 2012. 
uh, and it was processed by the parliament between 2010 and 2015. So we almost had a legislation that would really simplify the procedure and make everyone's life much easier. Yet in 2015 we had new elections and it was both elections to parliament and presidential elections. And seriously, it was just like two weeks time that the act would have passed. Yet we had the elections and um, the new president, when he was elected, he immediately vetoed this act. And, uh, and that ceased uh, policy work on this particular legal proposal. Um, Anna Grodzka, whom I've mentioned, is a very important person for Polish transgender movement because she was not only uh, the first and only a transgender member of our parliament, but she also founded a first for Polish foundation uh, supporting transgender people and it's called Transfusia. And uh, I mean this Gender Accordance Act failed, but her very presence in the parliament uh, brought up to public attention the existence of transgender people in the society. Because before, uh, many cisgender people didn't even realize uh, that there are transgender people, that there is, um, that there is transgender at all. And um, <coughs> for example, uh, the survey I uh, carried out shortly before Anna was uh, elected to the parliament shows that the majority of cisgender people uh, in Poland either had no idea what transgender is or they couldn't see a difference between a transgender person and a lesbian or a gay um, or perceived transgender people as freaks or degenerates. And um, as you can guess, there was a lot of publicity around Anna Grodzka. Um, in the media and she was exposed to a lot of personal affront and insult, not only in the media, uh, but during the parliament sessions as well. And as she told me in one of our conversations, it's not enough to be an expert. One must also be an exhibit. That's the clue to convincing other people and that's the nature of the media. What I'm doing, I can do through the media only, and the media demands such a personal engagement. And uh, it's Anna Grodzka and people like her. Um, for example, uh, Lalka Podobinska, Wiktor Dynarski, Anna Maria Szymkowiak, um, and others uh, who are making a change, or Marcin Rzeczkowski. And except right now, except for Transfusia Foundation in Warsaw, we also have another uh, foundation supporting transgender people in Poznań. It's called Fundacja Akceptacja, and it was founded by Anna Maria Szymkowiak. Also, uh, there are more support groups uh, for transgender people. When I started the group I facilitate, there were only two or three groups uh, in the whole country. And now some large cities have their support groups. Um, transgender people also write blogs. Uh, a very famous one was, the, was called Trans Optimist, written by Marcin Rzeczkowski. And um, although the situation slowly changes, and I can see a significant difference between what was happening just a few years ago and the situation uh, now, still the majority of Polish society is unaccepting and perceive trans people as a threat to the established social order. And still transgender people, um, if they experience violence, for example, do not report it to the police. And uh, that's because uh, they are afraid to be ridiculed, uh, they are afraid that the police will not take it seriously, that we do nothing about it. Um, and. Uh, also, not all trans people receive the same um, social reception or are discriminated in a similar way. Um, if somebody is binary in their experience gender and fits the image of a so-called true transsexual model, uh, would much more likely be accepted. 
uh, as someone who post-transition can be kind of restored to the society as a normative person. Non-binary, genderqueer people won't get that acceptance at all. But even among binary people, uh, there is apparently a significant difference whether a person is transitioning female to male or male to female. And first of all, uh, trans men are less visible in the society. And uh, even before the transition, they can more easily blend into society. And if I could ask you to show the slide, as David says, in my opinion, FTM persons are perceived better in the society. There is something like, well, a girl is simply seen as a tomboy. But a boy who displays female features is generally portrayed by a great part of the society as a fuck or a tranny. And I think that more often such people are being discriminated. Even in the streets, when people see a girl dressed like a man, they will say, Boo, a boot, right? Everyone will think that and go their own way. But when they see a man wearing a dress, he may be immediately beaten up. And of particular notice that in Poland, trans men are also less visible from the linguistic point of view. And uh, here I need to make a footnote. Uh, that uh, Polish language is very gendered. Um, not gendered the way, for example, French is gendered, that objects have gender, we also have that, but additionally, every, not only uh, pronouns, but also nouns, verbs, adjectives, numeral forms, um, they express the gender of the person who's speaking and the person to whom the speech is addressed. And so, for example, if I have a conversation with you, I would always express my gender and I would always address to you uh, assigning uh, some gender. And this is both in singular and in plural. So there's also nothing like a gender neutral day because there are two different day depending on if it's female people or male people. And also, uh, we don't have a word for gender. We just have word płeć, which means both sex and gender, because linguistically it's assumed that it's exactly the same. Um, in social sciences, we just use the English term, gender. And it's perceived uh, as very controversial within the society. The opponents of the constructionist approach uh, often accused social science, scientists of uh, spreading gender ideology or genderizing the youth. And uh, thus the very word transgender seems really scary. Yet, why trans men are also less visible from the linguistic point of view? Masculine forms can sometimes be used as generic forms, especially if it concerns some professional context. Those jobs, occupations or positions that usually have a higher social status and uh, traditionally used to be male occupation only, don't have female forms. So if I want to talk about myself as a professor or as a sociologist, I would have to use the vocabulary as if I was a man. Uh, same if you write a book and you address to multiple readers, you address to the readers as if they were men only. I mean, right now many feminist movements uh, invent feminine forms, yet we don't have gender neutral forms. But because uh, those masculine forms sometimes in professional contexts can be used as generic forms, trans men can be less visible from the linguistic point of view. Otherwise, a transgender person must always express their gender to others. And there is always the question, should I express the gender I identify with or the gender that may be perceived by others, right? And um, trans uh, men also generally receive a better form of social uh, reception than trans women. Um, also due to a cultural um, greater appreciation of masculinity and also less expectations assigned to masculinity than femininity. 
and as Carolina says, I think that for a very simple reason, while connected with men's position in our society, let's say it clearly higher position, and at the same time lower expectations on the side of men and their certain looks, so it seems to me that trans men more easily blend into background and are more easily accepted by the society. Well, it had to be had to have manifested itself on many levels. We always expect differently from men, and we expect less, it seems to me. And it is certainly a clue to everything. Uh, people who know the stereotype of East European men will probably agree with Caroline, right? And uh, also, transitioning from uh, female uh, to male um, is perceived as a social elevation in a patriarchal society. Um, and as my respondents say, with FTMs there is a more unconscious or maybe more conscious attitude of the society. Oh, a nobleman, social advancement, it's gonna be a man. On the other hand, when you're an MTF, it works like this. It's a freak, he downgrades himself socially. Yola says, what they want to say is that what a madman would, out of his free will, want to be a woman. And uh, also trans men uh, often say that while transitioning, uh, they truly experience uh, gaining some kind of male privilege. And here I would also like to give you some citations. And it can be both in professional and private life. Piotr talks about his professional life. Well, even at work, because I changed my job after the correction. Here he means the, having the legal gender markers changed. I see that uh, they've started treating me more seriously, as if I knew more than before. He's doing exactly the same job, in exactly the same way, yet he's perceived as a more professional person. David talks about his uh, home relations. Earlier, my mom was always trying to teach me how to cook, in which she never succeeded, and now she let it go. It is definitely a privilege, now that she let me off the hook. Earlier she would also say things like, you're a girl and you won't even help me peel these potatoes. Now she let go. She even says, sure thing that a man doesn't know how to peel potatoes, so I will do it myself. There are such situations. She let me off the hook with the cooking and this is definitely a privilege. And even in childhood, um, masculine behavior in children assigned female at birth was received much b better than feminine behavior in those children who were assigned male at, bir at birth. In some situations, even a tomboy girl was received more appropriately than a girly girl. And this is very easy to notice if we compare uh, some uh, memories from childhood uh, by trans men and trans women. Um, two of the trans men recall situations like that. For example, my grandfather was, he had this opinion that a girl can act a bit like a boy, but a boy must be masculine. So I think that if it was the other way around, opposite situation, there may have been some problems. Instead, in my case, there weren't any and everything was okay. Marcel says, my dad, I suppose, it slipped out once when I was doing something that in his opinion wasn't very feminine. He said, well, I'd like to have a son. And if we compare it with what trans feminine people uh, recall, it's very different. Marianna says, I was 12, something like 11 or 12. It was the first time when my parents caught me epilating, it was like regulating my eyebrows. So when my father caught me, when I finished epilating, he got me and started beating me up. My mother came, we will put you in a psychiatric clinic, you psycho, we will put you in a clinic, and so on. And you know, such threats, so I started hiding away from them. Magdalena uh, talks about another situation, that mother acknowledged it with a statement that is still very telling today. Well, if you wish, wear dresses and walk around the house like that after which she ridiculed me and ended the whole discussion. That was the moment uh, she came out in front of her mother. And um, it's not 
At first, I was surprised that many transgender people, especially uh, trans women, uh, told me that it was the mothers who were not very accepting. Um, intuitively, one could expect this would be fathers. I asked them for the reasons and talked more about it, and then I realized that it's also a cultural thing, that a mother is perceived as the one who's responsible for upbringing a child. And if a child doesn't behave or doesn't become the person a society would expect the child, then it's the mother's fault. For example, if a child misbehaves or is not perceived as what mm, they should be, uh, we have a saying like, how did your mother raise you? I don't know if it's also in English. Nobody says, how did your father raise you? People don't even say, how did your parents raise you? It's always, how did your mother raise you? So those mothers, they feel the whole social pressure placed on them uh, that they have wrongly brought up their child. Also, some diagnosticians, if they want to talk to their parents, uh, for example, when the uh, person is underage, they even ask the mother about the pregnancy, like, did you drink alcohol or something? So it's always putting the blame on mothers, and this is maybe why the mothers may contract with being less accepting. And um, also, uh, trans men um, more easily find life partners than trans women do. But this is a rule that uh, works only in case uh, of those trans men who are attracted to women. Can I ask you to show a citation? Because see, girls cling to FTMs and they have no problems with finding a girlfriend, while MTFs are alone and they can't find a man because men treat them, you know how they treat men. They are, I think, more afraid of themselves. And uh, many trans women um, choose to be in a relationship with another woman. It's not because, uh, well, one of them told me that she's a lesbian by choice. She said that she was sexually attracted to men, but she didn't believe she could find a man who would be in a relationship with her. Thus, she decided to be in a relationship with a woman. And that's what some trans women do. So trans men in Poland are not only more likely to build a heteronormative relationship with a cisgender woman, but they are also under pressure to do so. And um, if you can show the slide, as Marek says, it's all based on proving oneself that you are that man and you can have a genetic girlfriend who sees a guy with you. And it's like the Freudian concept of asserting one's masculinity through heteronormative relationship. And uh, of course, uh, it's not only building this relationship, as I've told you before, it's also keep a part of keeping to the socially acknowledged standards of normative gender performativity as expected by the diagnosticians. The opinion itself depends on a given doctor's or psychologist's opinion of what a trans person should act like, look like, and feel like. Not every man has short hair. Why an FTM should? Not every man is tough and has a uh, typically masculine hobby. Why should an FTM? And uh, also uh, this need of having a cisgender girlfriend uh, sometimes uh, becomes uh, a part of transgender uh, men's identity. Um, they internalize it. And uh, it's often also based in uh, and linked to the wrong body discourse. Um, as Zdzisław says, I live with a woman. I can't imagine a man touching me as long as I have my present body. If my body were proper, I wouldn't have such objections. This is all about asserting oneself about the masculinity and asserting the social environment. And this is very telling that um, when their medical transition becomes advanced, many transgender men don't have any longer these objections. 
In my opinion, very often, the bare fact of starting treatment causes the FTM to feel more self-confident and a bit more reconciled. It reassures his own masculinity. As a result, he doesn't have to be afraid, not even before himself, that he's unmanly and fulfill the ideal of masculinity, which is, among other things, being a womanizer. And this self-assertion and social proof of one's masculinity may also take different forms. <coughs> I mean, cultural normative sexuality is one of them, but may take also different forms. And I'm sure you like the story of Stash, uh, who uh, lives in a small village and was not tolerated by many cisgender men um, in uh, his village. Thus, he literally fought for his masculinity. And it's best if you hear his own words. There are arguments and arguments. I have a few friends who are, to say, able to persuade something either with the strength of their speech or with the strength of their fists. And they are on my side, so I really don't have to worry about this, who I am. Others either accept this or are quiet, because they are scared. And I am lucky to have buddies and friends who are really tall and have such powers. So if they punch somebody once and for all, then nothing bothers me. Everyone, if they had something against me, they have told that long time ago, and now they are quiet because they see um, that it won't change anything. And if anyone still has something against, also would rather be quiet because either me or someone else may punch them for that. It was simply a forced tolerance. Even though I haven't punched anybody in the face for a long time, they still remember and they know, nevertheless, I can do this. <laughs> so what Stash says that, according to him, acting like that brought him a respect in his social environment. Not only because the bullies are scared now, but also because uh, he proved uh, in his environment to be a real man who has guts to beat someone up. So it was like a social proof of masculinity. And uh, the thing is that many trans men recall the story of fighting for their masculinity, not always literally like stuff, like stash, um, after transition. But trans women say that they felt similar social pressure to conform to the standards of masculinity before the transition. In other words, um, both people transitioning female to male and male to female uh, feel the pressure at a certain point of their lives uh, to conform to the patterns of masculinity much less than the model of femininity at another point of their life. And um, this is probably connected with the overall cultural elevation of masculinity. Masculinity uh, which is perceived as being desired, as uh, something that elevates socially. And it makes it a bastion of um, inviolable gender norms to which one can aspire, but one cannot abandon. And thus it causes a more conformist attitude towards it uh, than in case of uh, feminine gender norms. But, apart from the strategies of assimilation, uh, there are also strategies uh, of active resistance. Uh, some uh, trans men choose to be gender benders, um, juggling the acknowledged gender norms. Of course, many trans women would choose this strategy too, but in their case, um, it's not that visible because uh, many people will draw a conclusion that they were either not able to blend into the society or that they didn't want to lose some of the male privilege. In case of trans men, who are perceived as those who can blend in, who get a better social reception, it's expected that they will um, admire this fact that because of that they will be willing to conform. Uh, thus, if they become gender benders, if they're juggling the gender norms, it's much more visible. Uh, 
they seem to be more expressive than trans women in this situation because when officially, after obtaining the male status, they distance themselves from normative masculinity and exert a challenge to the gender dichotomy. And as two of them say, I don't have to be ideal. I don't have to be more masculine than all the other men to be one of them. It is not the doctor's note that determines if I have the right to feel like a man or not. I don't see any reason to run away from who I really am. Slowly, as Martin says, very slowly, I started consciously depart from the pattern of a true transsexual. I was looking for signs that you could live differently, that you could be happy and fulfilled. And concluding, uh, generally the Polish system tends to uh, conform people into previously constructed gender categories. Transgender pe person may eventually be accepted um, if they prove to be normative um, respectively to the uh, socially acknowledged gender norms uh, in their post-transition life. Yet the testimonies of trans individuals show that the reality, in fact, it's not like that. It is fake identities. It is forced identities. And um, I would like to conclude with Aaron de Vos words, who uh, wrote it many years before I even started my research, that the idea that all persons can be neatly classified within the available gender, sex and sexual categories is an untenable one. We humans may find binarisms easy to understand, but nature is not so simple-minded. Thank you.